and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. Today, I'm in Mayfair in London to find out more about the life of the UK's former Chief of the Defence Staff, in layman's terms, Britain's highest ranking soldier, as well as get his take on the current global conflicts dominating the news. General Sir Nick Carter is our longest serving military chief since Lord Mountbatten and was head of the British Army. He joined the Royal Green Jackets and Infantry Regiment in 1977 as a fresh faced 18 year old straight out of Sandhurst. During more than four decades in the armed forces, he played a key role in Britain's strategies for conflicts including Afghanistan and Iraq, advising prime ministers and the National Security Council. Nick has led operations at every level of command, including the troubles in Northern Ireland, UN peacekeeping in Cyprus, NATO peace enforcement in Bosnia and Kosovo, and commanding the UK-led brigade in Iraq. Now he's consulting, spending more time with his family, and I'm guessing enjoying life on the golf course. So Nick, it is an honour to meet you. Am I correct about the golf course? <laughs> yes, well, you are up to a point. I have um, I have got back into golf, having really not played much for about the last 10 years of my military life. So it's um, it's good fun. And I've got three sons who will play as well. So Fantastic. it's a very good place to be. Good, good, good. Now you serve more than four decades in, in the forces, which is really your entire career so far? I say so far because I know you're doing new things, but how do you feel or how did you feel a couple of years ago about leaving when it's been such an integral part of your life? Yes, I mean, I think you, you go through a phase of what I would describe as bereavement to begin with. And then I think you pretty quickly realise it's liberation because actually the last sort of eight years of my life as a chief of staff, first as head of the army and then head of the armed forces, they're tough, tough jobs and they're pretty 24-7, and you're dancing to a lot of tunes that aren't necessarily the tunes you want to dance to, and they're high-stress environments. So I think from my perspective, it was a relief to finish, even though I wouldn't have missed the 45 years of military service for anything. That's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary length of time, isn't it? I'm just imagining you as that young 18-year-old going to your infantry regiment, and I just wonder if at that time you had any idea which way your career would unfold. No, I mean, I was always leaving. To my wife's eternal chagrin, I didn't leave. <laughs> but um, no, I actually signed off when the first Gulf War started. And I had a very interesting job at the time, which may encourage me to sign back on again. And then I stayed on after that. So that was really my late 20s. And originally when I joined, I was in a go in for three or four years. And my father was very clear that he wasn't going to send me to what he called Red Brick University. So I might as well go and do something constructive. Hence the army. And then I think he wanted me to get a professional qualification like accountancy or the law. But actually, I was enjoying serving by that stage. So I saw through most of my 20s before then getting married and deciding to leave. And then, of course, the rest is history. And what was that interesting role that you were playing in the Gulf that made you want to continue? I was the military assistant to a lieutenant general who had the responsibility for being our sort of senior person in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf more generally, even though he was based in the UK. So when Saddam invaded Kuwait, he was the logical person for the then chief of defence staff to send out to see what we could do to help the United States. And we had a very interesting journey out there. I, I remember in, I guess, late August of that particular year, what was it, 1989, I suppose. And we brokered in the, the first armoured division into the American Orbat and everything associated with it. And it was fascinating times. And who would have imagined that that would be going on as the Cold War was ending? Fascinating. What about since you've left, what new opportunities have opened up and what kind of work are you doing now that you've got chance to perhaps sit back a bit and breathe and reflect and use that experience from 45 odd years? I was quite determined when I finished serving, that I didn't want to do, I wanted to do something different. I, I didn't really want to do anything that was associated with the military. And indeed, the rules are quite clear that for a couple of years after you finish, you can't actually do anything that was really associated with your former life. So you're in a way, you're encouraged to do something different. And I got some very good advice from various people who told me that, you know, you want to try and make sure you retain some flexibility. So don't necessarily leap to get onto somebody's board because you'll find your diary gets bogged down pretty quickly. They advised me to think about it in terms of work out what sort of life you want to lead first and then work out how work can fit in around to enable that life to be led. Sort of break it down into different sort of categories. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to try and put something back in sort of training and educational terms. So I got this great gig as a visiting fellow at Stanford University at the Hoover Institute on the West Coast, which suits me very well as I have a son in Dallas, so not far away from California. And that was something I wanted to do. 
then obviously I was in a way quite fortunate that Putin chose to invade Ukraine about two months after I finished in the post. And all of a sudden people thought, gosh, an understanding of geopolitics is actually quite useful from a business perspective. So as a result of that, I got a couple of advisory roles, one in Convex, which I thoroughly enjoy, one with Schroders, and then the Tony Blair Institute came looking for me. And I do work for Tony Blair's Institute on the sort of national security side of things. And then I do quite a lot of sort of private briefings on geopolitics. I might do quite a lot of stuff for firms like Goldman Sachs, which I enjoy. I made a conscious effort this apart to do no media. A, because I don't think it's particularly fair on the fellow who'd taken over from me that I would pop up from time to time. I thought it was a bit unfair on him, so I avoided that. But also, actually, you know, I did a lot of media when I was serving. I wanted to stand back and you know not get too involved in media again for a while, so I've avoided doing any media. And then, yeah, I do some charitable stuff. Some of that's always worthy and fun. And I mentor a few people. Sounds busy, but actually, it's probably no more than three or four days a week maximum. And obviously, there's a bit of travel, which I enjoy as well. Uh, it does sound busy. We interviewed for the podcast a former colleague of mine from Sky News Days. I told you before we started recording this interview, I was a very naive 20-something-year-old presenter broadcasting live on the Iraq conflict, actually, when you were out there with Saddam, etc., Tim Marshall was our defence correspondent for a long, long time, and he's written a lot of books now about geopolitics. And I suppose geopolitics is actually really at the heart of it with Putin and the Russia situation. Would you explain that to us? Because it's a word I think that's thrown around that we don't always necessarily understand, but it's really important, isn't it, where countries sit and lie? I think that's exactly right. And of course, you know, some of the people who want advice from people like me are people who are probably trying to make money in markets and the relationship between real world events, which essentially is what geopolitics are about, and real world leaders and how they influence events has a massive bearing on markets and prices of stuff and supply chains and all of those sorts of things. So I think during the sort of period post-Cold War for the next 15 to 25 years, yes, there was a sort of perturbation when we got involved in the probably not very well-named war against terror. But in principle, the world was relatively stable and people understood that the United States was prepared to be the world's policeman. And based upon US hegemony, you could be reasonably confident that supply chains would work and that markets wouldn't change that much and that actually active management wasn't necessarily that important. And then, of course, the world then became much more competitive. And as we emerged from that great war against terror, as it was called, all of a sudden we see China rising, we see Russia being more assertive. And we see this idea of great competition again, and the US's position, and indeed the position the US wants to take in the world, changes because the US becomes much more interested in China and what the US has to do about China. And for all those reasons, we suddenly end up with a world that's a lot less stable than the world we might have had at the beginning of this century. And actually, it's a world now that I think looks much more like the world of the 1930s or the world of the 1910s. And I think that it probably sounds a little alarmist, but some of the things that are going on in the world today are probably not dissimilar to the foothills of world wars of the last century. So I think it's right that people perhaps study their history again and they think about the interaction between countries and how countries behave. And now increasingly, we've got, I think, a framework in the world that's breaking down into sort of four broad groupings of countries. You've got those who are obviously pro-West, led by the United States. You've then got those that are anti-West, with a really quite unholy, openly hostile alliance between Russia, Iran, North Korea, with perhaps China offering some support to a degree, but certainly anti-West. And then increasingly, you've got a sort of interesting group of multi-aligned countries who've got their own political and economic clout and feel they can exercise it by being multi-aligned. And you see that perhaps with India, with Indonesia, with Brazil, with Saudi Arabia, the UAE to a degree. And these are countries that can probably play both ends off against the middle in terms of pro versus anti-West. And then you've got a lot of other countries that perhaps used to be called the global South that haven't got that level of political and economic clout, which are in a sense pawns on the checkerboard. And they are countries that you see but people arguing for resources over rare earths, precious metals. You see a lot of that in Africa. And of course, you see that competition playing out between what China and Russia want and what we want in the West at the expense of those countries. And that very much becomes a battle of our different narratives. So it's a world that's become much more dynamic. It's a world that's much more complex. It's a world where there's a lot of interaction and it's very interconnected. 
but it's also a world that is increasingly breaking down, I think, into groupings of countries that don't necessarily act entirely positively for a global sense of order. And as a result of that, I think we should worry ourselves slightly that the rules-based system that was created after the Second World War is probably increasingly fragile and vulnerable. And that vulnerability means that so many of the global problems that we need to fix, whether it's climate change, whether it's pandemics, whether it's the rapid changes in technology, whatever it might be, these are problems that need global solutions. And if the globe doesn't come together to sort them, then we're going to be all the more worse off for it. Two thoughts spring to mind as you say that. What are the similarities that you see perhaps between 1910 and 1930s? And then I'd also like to ask in this unstable world which we seem to be living in right now, I suppose warfare has changed, hasn't it, in terms of only today Iran was warning that it's reviewing its nuclear doctrine, perhaps that sabre rattling, I, I don't know. But two things struck me there, the 1910, 1930s reference and the fact that it's a very different space, isn't it, warfare now? Yes. I mean, I think a lot of what has changed, but in a sense is similar to the 1910s and the 1930s, is nationalism and the nature of leadership. And of course, what we see increasingly, and it falls much out of social media and the, if you like, sort of way that information is now democratised, if you want, is we see this sort of phenomenon of populism. Uh, we see the phenomenon of the strong man leader, whether that's a, a President Modi or a President Erdogan or a Putin or a Xi Jinping. You know, these are strong men leaders. And of course, that is quite similar to the sorts of leadership that you saw 100 years ago, or for that matter, 80 years ago. That's perhaps concerning because nationalism is in many ways rather dangerous. And if you combine nationalism with populism, and of course, what comes with populism is often bellicose rhetoric, and you add that perhaps to poor education, you get all sorts of worrying phenomenon. And you know, we're all nervously looking across the Atlantic to see what might happen on the 7th of November this year. Yes, who knows what will happen on the 7th of November this year. Conflict-wise, obviously a lot of worrying stuff going on in the world right now. And I'm just wondering, although obviously you're completely on top of what's going on for your new world, militarily, how is it for you to be sitting perhaps more on the sidelines on that front or not having that top job in the army? I feel liberated in many ways. That doesn't mean that I'm showing no interest in it. Of course, I'm showing interest in it. And I travelled back and forth to Israel quite a lot recently, been to Ukraine a couple of times. I am obviously observing what is happening and thinking hard about it and what it means and indeed offering advice where people might want to take that advice. You know, the reality is, is that what we're seeing playing out in Ukraine and of course now in the Middle East is very much as a result of the nature of the geopolitical context that I described in this conversation. It wouldn't have happened 25 years ago, but now we are in a much more competitive world in a world that is a lot less ordered and governed in the way that it was 25 years ago. And the upshot of all of that is that conflict, sadly, is now possible at a scale and intensity, which I think we all rather hoped we weren't going to see again when 1945 came to an end. Has retiring in a way from your day job, if you like, made you feel a little lighter in terms of perhaps free of the burden of being responsible for soldiers? You know, you're asking troops under your command to go into very dangerous, life-threatening situations, mentally and physically draining. Does it feel some kind of relief? And did you find that a burden? I think, yes, there is part of the liberation. It's not just liberation from having to continually argue the case for the armed forces and everything associated with it, with political leadership and the like. But it's also, in a sense, liberation from responsibility. There is something liberating about only being responsible for yourself and your family for a while, having been responsible for lots of people all your life. So there is liberation in that. But I don't think I ever found it a burden. I mean, there were burdensome moments when you got let down by certain individuals, probably. And so does always have a propensity to do that. It, it's part of the fun of the job. But no, I think it's a privilege to be responsible for other people. And I think if you don't view it as a privilege, you probably won't lead them right. And what has struck me hugely since I've come into the outside world and the private sector, both the sort of asset management arena in terms of my time with Schroeder's and the insurance market with Convex, is that leadership really matters and that these industries don't necessarily help people grow up to be great leaders. And to my mind, there's a bit of work to be done on that. So I think leadership is really important. I mean, yes, of course, you know, there are really tough times when you're commanding soldiers in combat environments. And a lot of people died under my command in southern Afghanistan in 2009 and 10 at the height of Obama's surge. I mean, I had a lot of Americans under my command. 
And not a day goes past when you don't think about them. And certainly, as you were putting more bodies on the back of an aeroplane at 3 a.m. on Kandahar Airfield or in Camp Bastion, you obviously question what's going on and whether or not your plan is a good plan. So these are duties that you don't take lightly and they're responsibilities you don't take lightly. And it does make you think hard about war, the nature of conflict, what you're up to. You know the rights and wrongs of it. In broad terms, given the fact that every hour there are new developments, I'd just like to ask a bit about where you think we are at the moment. I know it's an ever-changing picture, but with the Israel-Gaza situation, what's your assessment of that? What's been interesting over the last week or so is the events of last Saturday night where Iran launched a, a, an attack for the very first time since the revolution in 1979 directly against Israel. That has distracted attention from what's been going on on the ground in Gaza. And in a way, that's probably ironically quite convenient from an Israeli perspective, I should think. But of course, you can't escape from the fact that there are two million Palestinians in Gaza who are, if not starving, certainly leading a very hand-to-mouth existence in an environment where law and order is broken down, where the summer is coming. There's very few places to live. I mean, Gaza has been decimated over the last five months or so. And the reality, of course, is that Israel is yet to achieve her war objectives in Gaza, in that the Hamas military leadership is still alive, and there are still a number of hostages that have yet to be released or found. So the answer is that that's going to play out over a long period of time. And I think that whilst eyes and attention are focused on Iran and what Israel might do in response to what took place on Saturday night at the moment, you know, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that there are 1.7 million of those 2.2 million Palestinians now kettled into the town of Rafa at the southern end of Gaza, which is where the Hamas leadership is, probably where a lot of the hostages are. And that is something that Israel will feel it needs to do something about. And that, you know, is quite something to reflect on and how that perhaps may unfold, given the weight of casualties that we've seen in civilian terms since the 7th of October. And then, of course, that's before you even think about what's going on in the West Bank, where the level of violence is greater than it's been in a generation and where the Palestinian Authority is struggling to pay the bills because they're not getting their tax income from the Israeli government at the moment and people are not being able to work in Israel and travel from the West Bank to do that. And then, of course, there's the northern border and the northern border, some 100,000 or so Israelis were evacuated in October and they're living still at hotels in the big cities like Haifa and Tel Aviv. And that's not sustainable. They need to go home at some stage, but of course it's too dangerous to go home at the moment because you know there is a, a degree of violence going on on and off, back and forth across that northern Israeli border with Lebanon, with Hezbollah, and you know Hezbollah is sitting there and is a clear and present threat in all sorts of ways, and is very well armed. It's got hundreds of thousands of missiles, which would be very challenging for even the impressive Israeli air defence system to deal with. So there's much going on there before you even factor in the whole what happens with Iran next type question. And then when you look to Iran's proxies beyond Lebanon with Hezbollah to Syria and Iraq, and of course, their relationship with the Houthis in Yemen, there are some challenges out there. And who would have thought even a few months ago that we'd see the level of passaging through the Suez Canal diminished by 50%. That is the Houthis holding the Bad al and the Red Sea to hostage. And it's a pretty serious set of circumstances in terms of global events and the global economy. What are the challenges, Nick, of trying to find some kind of middle ground and reconciliation, or as the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, puts in an interview with you, a non-destructive way of disagreement. You were big on meaningful conversations. How do you attempt to find that middle ground and what will be going on behind the scenes? I mean, there obviously has to be a preparedness for compromise between the participants. And we're not yet in a position where this current Israeli government is prepared to compromise. As people will know, Netanyahu's government is propped up by a number of ultra-Orthodox, very right-wing members of parliament. And they are not likely to want to compromise or indeed have a conversation about a future Palestinian state, whatever that might look like, whether it's a two-state solution or something else. And of course, absent being able to have a conversation about the longer-term political horizon, it's very difficult to see how you can get into the political answers that are needed in Gaza or for that matter on, on the West Bank. So I think much work needs to be done to work out what a future political horizon could look like 
so that the conversation can happen the moment that the Israeli government is better placed to be able to have that conversation. Now, in the meantime, that doesn't mean you can't do stuff. There are local political solutions that could probably be brokered on the ground in Gaza, obviously not with Hamas, but potentially with elements of Fatah, which is the other Palestinian party which makes up the Palestinian Authority at the moment, or maybe other people as well. But these sort of conversations have to happen because at the end of the day, people need to be connected to governance at a local level as a minimum. Because only through that can you bring some law and order. Only through that can you then satisfy Maslow's needs for human beings to survive. And everything flows from that. So that's really what's got to happen. And we need to find a way as an international community of engineering that to happen. Because I don't think it will be easy for the Israeli Defence Forces to do that. Do you have any examples, Nick, that perhaps you can share that would illustrate, perhaps from your time in Afghanistan, about how you try to have those conversations? And is it important as well to engage communities at that level? It's fundamental. And and what we certainly found in southern Afghanistan was that if we waited for governance to flow from the capital city, Kabul, and the government of Afghanistan, we'd be waiting a long time. So in the short term, what you need to do really is to work at a local level. And there were districts around the city of Kandahar where quite a lot of progress was made, as indeed it was in in Helmand, through having conversations with local political leaders, conversations that were conducted in a fashion that were always open-minded and always started from an understanding of what the local needs were, but also started from a perspective of really understanding the local political dynamics and understanding what people's agendas were. And there is no substitute for spending a great deal of time gathering the insight and understanding to be able to negotiate effectively. And I think that too often we think we can do this sort of stuff quickly. It's not. It takes real time and real expertise and real local knowledge to understand it. And ultimately, in the case of Afghanistan, these are conversations that we enable between Afghans. They're not conversations that you know, you're know you probably going to have yourself. You need to find a way of getting them to do it for themselves. And that would be the same in Gaza. These are conversations that will need to happen between Palestinians in order to engineer local political solutions. How did you feel with the Afghanistan situation when troops were pulled out after 20 years, the Taliban were back in power? Do you feel optimistic about the future because of the younger generation? Did that come as a great disappointment after a lot of loss of life? And how did you feel about that? You know, what took place in 2021, you have to go back to 2001 to understand why it happened. And the reality is that we got off on the wrong foot in 2001, where the then US Defence Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, was very clear that there wasn't going to be any nation building. And he was also very clear that the Taliban wouldn't be involved in any conversations about the future of Afghanistan. As far as he was concerned, they were crushed. Now, of course, as we're seeing in Gaza as well, that's not the way you can operate in these circumstances, because you can't defeat or destroy an idea. And the Taliban essentially was an idea. And therefore, you have to acknowledge that the idea is one that belongs to, in the case of Afghanistan, a whole load of different Pashtun tribes people. And once you've decided you're not going to include them in the conversation, you are creating an exclusive government, which is what has happened now with the Taliban. And if you create an exclusive government, there's always going to be a lot of grumpy people who are not included, who will wish to make mischief. And that, of course, is exactly what happened. And the upshot of all of that is if we had been prepared to incorporate them in the conversation, particularly at the Bonn conference in December 2001, I think we might have been able to help the Afghans construct their country in a different way. That sort of level of understanding and the political strategy that would flow from it would have meant that the events of 2021 would probably never have happened. So despite the Obama surge in 2009-10 and the huge amount of additional resources and stuff that went in at that stage to try and fix things. The reality was, in many ways, the die was cast. Sort of takes me back a little bit to the Northern Ireland troubles, which, again, I covered as a very young journalist. I know you were there also very young at the time. I remember we'd do an interview with Jerry Adams and we'd have to have his audio voiced by somebody else because his voice, you, I'm sure you remember these times, wasn't allowed on the airwaves. And eventually Sinn Féin came to the table, didn't they? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, all these things end in a conversation and they all end in an inclusive set of arrangements. And to get to that point, invariably, you have to compromise. Compromises to end wars are often very distasteful because it means you've got to sit down and talk to what we might regard as terrorists. 
On what happens then with Russia and Ukraine? I notice the Ukrainian Prime Minister is in Washington today talking about a potential, in his words, third world war if Ukraine loses the conflict. And I think he's urging Congress to pass a long stalled foreign aid bill. Where could that conversation be there that doesn't look on the surface as if there are any areas of coming together between Putin and Zelensky? At the moment, President Putin probably believes that he has the initiative. And given that he's able to reinforce his army with 30,000 additional soldiers every month, and given that he's got five times as much artillery ammunition as the Ukrainians have got, and given that the Ukrainians have really are running out of air defence interceptors, you can understand why Putin at the moment would not really want to have a conversation because he's got the initiative. And I think he thinks that this summer he will make a great deal of progress on that battlefield and push the lines some way further west. So the answer is that Ukraine need to be in a position where they can talk from strength. And that's why it's very important that the West provides them with the support they need. And the 61 billion US dollars, which is locked up in the hill at the moment, if that was released, and I think there is some hope that this week it might be released, then that would obviously be massively helpful because it would provide Ukraine with the sort of material that it needs. But Ukraine is also going to have to find a way of training more soldiers because we should be in no doubt that their army is fragile without enough soldiers. So it's a culmination of factors that Ukraine are going to need. But I think if the money was unlocked in the US, and I think if European leaders could start to deliver some of the stuff that we've seen very encouraging rhetoric about, then that would improve Ukrainian morale enormously. And that might prevent Putin from making the sort of inroads this summer that we're all worried will be made otherwise. I think you warned in a speech about six years ago, Nick, that Moscow represented a clear and present danger on Europe's doorstep and could initiate hostilities sooner than we expect. Here in Britain, was that warning heeded? No, not at all. I mean, interestingly, two months later, the Scripple family was attacked in Salisbury, which did focus the attention of the British government at the time. But I don't think the British government envisaged something like what we've seen happen in Ukraine, which was where my speech was implying. And I think, in fact, you were advising that we should reduce Britain's vulnerabilities to Russian influence and upgrade our armoured infantry capabilities. And ministers cut back armoured vehicles, didn't they? And cut, was it 10,000 troops, I think, at the time? Yes. Well, that, of course, happened a bit later in the Defence Review of 2020, when the size of the army was reduced. And yes, I mean, I think that money is tight. Government is all about risk management. But I think we've probably reached a point, given what's playing out in Ukraine and in Europe more generally, when actually we're going to have to spend money on defence and that's a bad place to be. But I'm afraid it's going to come at a cost in terms of the other things governments might want to spend their money on. What was it like for you? What kind of memories do you have liaising directly with prime ministers? And how frank did you have to be in those four walls talking honestly about situations that you were involved in in your role? I served David Cameron, Theresa May, and then particularly Boris Johnson. That defence review of 2020 that I mentioned, you know, Boris Johnson gave us an additional £26 billion, pounds, which is the largest uplift in defence expenditure we had seen since the end of the Cold War, which was you know, an achievement one was pleased on. Yes, of course, the where things were cut, of course they were cut, but the bottom line is that it was a lot of additional investment and it was also a lot of money that was needed to stop other things collapsing. It was a moment where a Prime Minister listened and actually stepped up to the plate and delivered. And I remember that moment vividly and was very relieved that it happened. If you're advising political leaders as a senior military figure, you know, you have to think quite hard about their perspective and expect to be challenged, but also recognise that you've got to make the case. You can't just make assumptions that you're going to be listened to. And I think the art of it is to work out that it's a two-way process and that in that two-way process, you hope that you'll be listened to and you make the case as convincingly as you can. And at the end of the day, we live in a democracy. If the political leadership decide they're not going to listen to you, that's their choice. But you have to be sensible about how you make the case. And I think that's what a lot of military strategy is about. Was there any lighter moments that you particularly remember from any of the prime ministers you dealt with? 
yes, I remember Prime Minister Boris Johnson wanted to have a photograph with all of us as chiefs of staff at the time, and we refused to do it until he tucked his shirt in. <laughs> <laughs> I remember he used to come into GMTV, I think it was when he was mayor of London, actually, and he'd always arrive on his bike. Yeah. But we'd always catch him in the hallways before he came to the studio, making his hair look worse, <laughs> as if he just cycles through a storm or whatever. But obviously yeah, quite we, a- we were very much there resplendent in our uniform, and we wanted him to look the part alongside us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope he did make him, he did make him totally. Oh, yeah, he did. Good, Sorry, good. Right. When some kind of peace between warring nations is eventually found, what are the psychological effects of war? What effects do soldiers and also civilians face? Because I'm imagining it's going to be a very tough time for people in places like Israel, Palestine, Ukraine. Yes, it will be uh, a very tough period. You know, we talk about post traumatic stress disorder. And I'm patron of a charity called Supporting Wounded Veterans, which is investing a great deal of time, effort and money into helping veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder try and rebuild their lives. And um, of course, what's interesting about it is it's a phenomenon that doesn't necessarily happen immediately after you have been involved in the event that caused it. It can happen 5, 10, and often as much as 15 years downstream. And I think we're finding that Certainly in the case of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, it's becoming more apparent now than perhaps it did even five years ago. So I think that these societies that will have been upended by wars in Israel or Ukraine, I'm afraid these are problems that they're going to be living with for a generation or two, because the trauma will not necessarily express itself that quickly. And I think that their governments will need to be conscious of that and think about how they're going to manage it and deal with it, because it's not easy. I think it's hard whether you've actually been directly involved in combat or whether you've been a family of somebody who's been involved in combat. These are difficult things to manage um, and we're not necessarily very good at it. Did you feel that you ever suffered with any effects of just having seen the kinds of things you've seen in your career? Yeah, well, I don't wake up in a muck sweat in the middle of the night at all, but I do often reflect on what I saw and what I did and what happened to people under my command. And I don't think I was particularly easy to live with when I came back from these things. And I don't think that these events, and if you go away for a long time, and I went away often for a year at a time, it has an impact upon the relationship you have with your wife, partner, or family, big time. I don't think any of us are particularly good at managing that. I certainly wasn't good at managing it and puts your family under a lot of stress. So these are difficult things. The important thing, I think, is to have an open mind and to recognise that you know, you need to think about how you manage it. And also, of course, you were thrown in very much at the deep end because we touched very briefly on the troubles, but you were very young and inexperienced. And I just wondered, probably newly out of Sandhurst and you're in Northern Ireland, what are your memories of being there as a young soldier when you first arrived? I think when you're only 18 years old, it's very glamorous. It's exciting. You know, it's your first command. So no, you don't really have time to feel frightened. You might feel daunted about some of the experiences you're going to have and some of the decisions that you have to make. But on the whole, you know, you're quite well prepared for it. And I think it becomes harder the older you get, because I think your sense of responsibility and your understanding of your role in that and the extent to which you would be prepared to take risk diminishes. As an 18 year old, you're invincible. You're never going to be shot or damaged or blown up or whatever. I think you confidently drove up the Falls Road, didn't you, in those early well, I days? Well, stupidly drove up the Falls <laughs> Road. Yes, I did. No, I didn't know. I remember arriving on the Belfast Ferry in my little mini with all my military kit stacked up and quite obviously on show and asking the chap who helped push the car off the ferry because it didn't start first time round, what was the direction to London, Derry? <laughs> and he pointed out, and I think I probably drove through a whole load of out-of-bounds areas, not least outside London, Derry, and got away with it. It was an unprofessional performance. But those are the things that happened when you were young. I know that your father served in the King's African Rifles and a career for you in the military wasn't always on the cards. I think you said your father said that he wasn't going to support you through a red brick university. But how pleased are you, Nick, that this did end up being your career? How much love have you got for the British Army and the life that you've had? I've had a hugely rewarding life and I've been very fortunate to have had a huge number of really very interesting opportunities and experiences as a consequence of it. And maybe one day one will sit down and write about it. I've had a lot of pleasure out of it, but it's been tough for my family and my kids. I mean, they've had a good start in life to one degree or another, but you know, I think one's not always be present and available. So I think one needs to recognise that about the military career. But that said, you know, I would commend a military career to anybody because if you like variety and you want to work with great people 
it's hard to beat it. We've ended every podcast for the last season asking about risk, the convex connection there. What would you say is the biggest risk that you've taken in your life, Cynic? I don't know. I suspect some of the conversations I've had with our political leadership <laughs> were probably quite risky in terms of my personal future and prospects. But yeah, and I obviously took risks, I suppose, on battlefields, particularly in Southern Afghanistan. And I suppose in many ways, you take a risk in pursuing a career that's quite a single career. You know, that could easily end in a cul-de-sac. I think that taking risk is the upside of all the whatever of opportunity. And, you know, if you're not prepared to take risk, you probably won't seize many opportunities. So to my mind, it's something you have to get on and do. Well, you've definitely not ended up in a cul-de-sac. And I just want to say a very big thank you. It's a real honour to sit down and have 40, 45 minutes in your company. And thank you for being so generous talking about what's going on around the world at the moment, as well as some of your memories from the past. No, well, thanks, Alan. It's been fun. You've been listening to General Sinek Carter, former head of the defence staff, talking about current conflicts and his four decades or so in the army, latterly as Britain's highest ranking officer. Download our podcast at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week with Major General Alistair Bruce, a direct descendant of Robert the Bruce, to talk about life in charge of Edinburgh Castle, his closeness to the late Queen and life on set as an historical advisor on Hollywood movies and series like Downton Abbey. Join me then.